and good evening friends welcome to acns webinars today is the sixth session of the webinars in the month of december and we are again blessed with the presence of two fantastic speakers with us today the first speaker for today is a stalwart in the field of cerebrovascular surgery from japan ladies and gentlemen it's my great honor to introduce you professor kazuira hongo the director of ina central hospital in a city nagano japan professor hongo was a previous chairman director and vice president of the Shinsu University School of Medicine he is an integral part of several international neurosurgical organizations around the world he was the past president of the academia eurasiana neurochirurgica he was also the past chair of the technology committee of the wfns he is a visiting professor at several internationally acclaimed centers for neurosurgery namely the air langa university indonesia state medical and pharmaceutical university of moldova and the temple university usa He has received several accolades both in his country as well as abroad for his outstanding contribution towards neurosurgery. He has left a deep impression in in the minds of his previous fellows who have visited Shinsu University and have motivated them towards hard work and high ethics. Professor Hongo has published several articles in renowned neurosurgery journals. He is on the editorial board of several leading journals in neurosurgery. It is indeed a great honor for us that he has accepted our humble invitation to speak at our webinars. Today, Professor Hongo will share his experience about brainstem cavernous malformations. The second speaker for today is our honored guest from China, Professor Xia Guang Tong. Professor Tong is the head of neurosurgery expert group of Tianjin Huanhu Hospital. He is also the vice president of the Tianjin Huanhu Hospital and director of the Tianjin Institute of Neurosurgery. is a doctoral supervisor of neurosurgery of the Nankai University and Tianjin Medical University he is a member of North American Society of Skull Base Surgery we are extremely grateful to professor tong to have accepted our invitation and speak to us in our webinars today professor tong is going to talk about posterior circulation bypass for complex aneurysms to chair today's webinar we are indeed honored by the presence of professor marco senzato from italy professor senzato is a president of the italian society of neurosurgery He is the director of Department of Neurosurgery, Hospital Niguarda, Milan, Italy. Professor Senzato reserves his expertise in cerebrovascular surgery and is a gifted surgeon, which is evident from the highly complex cases that he has operated and archived in his YouTube page. He has a special interest in the treatment of arteriovenous malformations, cavernous angiomas of the brainstem, and complex intracranial aneurysms and revascularization procedures, namely bypass. He is a member of the Cerebrovascular Board of the WFNS as well as the European Association of Neurosurgical Societies. We are really grateful to Professor Senzato to have accepted our invitation to chair this webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I hereby sincerely welcome today's speakers, Professor Kazuhira Hongo, Professor Ziao Guang Tong, and the Chair, Professor Marco Senzato, to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Bun Seng from Malaysia is my co-host for today, and with that introduction, may I please hand over the proceedings to Professor Senzato. Well, thank you. Uh, I am really honored about this invitation, and I'm very happy to to listen and looking forward to listen to these very interesting topics, because uh, brainstem cavernomas are one of the most difficult surgery in in cerebrovascular surgery. And there are several items that should be discussed, and, and uh, starting from indication with the new guidelines uh, to define what is a real safe entry zone, and to define where, uh, how to access uh, the the uh, the way, and how to reach them, and especially when they are deep in the brainstem. And uh, another topic I would like to to listen, and is one or something that. Uh, uh, create some problem to me is the problem of recurrence after surgery there they can happen and, and how to deal with them so i'm very interesting to listen and and i think that you already presented a very uh, pro, uh, the, the how uh, professor hongo is important in this topic and and he published uh, more than 500 publications so it's really a star in cerebrovascular surgery so we are going to to listen to him and learn from him uh, uh, a lot of things so i think now it's time to 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 start and give him the the speech and so thank you very much uh, for for this uh, invitation i'm 
and then please, uh, Professor Hongo, we are waiting for your speech. Thank you. Well, uh, good evening from Japan. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, Professor Sensato. Uh, it's a great honor for me to present in this uh, webinar, ACNS webinar. I'd like to share my slides. Yeah, uh, this is uh, my hospital I'm working right now in our central hospital near Matsumoto, uh, where I stayed more than 40 years. I'm enjoying uh, working in uh, this hospital right now after retiring from uh, Shinshu University. Well, my talk today is brainstem cavernous malformations. And especially, uh, I'll talk on what is the suitable surgical approach. Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> my main theme today. Well, uh, I have nothing to disclose. Well, uh, generally speaking, cavernous malformation, uh, there are a couple of uh, names, cavernous malformation. I think this is uh, preferably used and others, cavernous angioma, cavernoma, or cavernous hemangioma. These are uh, for cavernous malformation, yes. And here, I'd like to show uh, the uh, cover page of humans and when neurosurgical, neurological surgery textbook, seventh edition. A very fortunate time, one of the editor of vascular session section. And in this vascular session, there's some description of cavernous malformation. I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, laughly about the a cavernous malformation instance is 0 0.4 to 5, 0 0.4 to 0 0.5% of the population. And spontaneous, for spontaneous, uh, usually single lesion. As familiar occurrence uh, to multiple lesions, autosomal dominant. And regarding location, splatentorially 80%, and a posterior fossa 15%, and at the spinal cord, there are 5% occurrence. And uh, histologically, no intervening neural tissue. And how about hemorrhage rate, annual rate of hemorrhage? For superficial lesions, 0. it is said 0.5 to 1%. And uh, the lesion in the brainstem at about 5%. And spinal cord annual rate, hemorrhage rate about 2%. And how about surgical indications uh, for cavernous malformation? Uh, the patient with epileptic seizures, uh, the lesionectomy is indicated and lower in the cerebellar lesion with hemorrhage, it's a surgical removal is recommended. And deep-seated splatentorial or brain stem with uh, the patient repeated hemorrhage with progressive neurological deficit removal is uh, indicated. And how about timing of surgery? At least five days after hemorrhage, uh, because of the hematoma hardness, it's uh, easy, easily done at least five days after hemorrhage. And really, symptomatic progression requires emergency de uh, decompression. I have one or two such cases, uh, mainly in ac not acute, uh, chronic, subacute to chronic stage surgery. <clears throat> And how about goal of surgery? The complete resection while preserving neural function. And uh, developmental venous anomalies uh, should be preserved. Uh, these are the goal of surgery. Well, uh, the cavernous malformation locates, uh, as I mentioned, in any part of the brain, and including spinal cord, but how about brain stem? Brain stem is. Uh, uh, of course, and there is uh, lots of important uh, nucleus and fibers. So <clears throat> uh, indication and procedure will be difficult <clears throat> to do. 
Well, uh, first important thing is selecting a surgical approach to the brainstem region. To enter the brainstem from less eloquent area and the shallowest point. And to reach the brainstem with minimal damage to the brain parenchyma. So uh, we can say safe entry zone. Uh, there are several entry, safe entry zones uh, proposed. <coughs> Here is, I think, uh, one uh, very famous and important paper from Professor Spetzra, Microsurgical Anatomy of Safe Entry Zone to the Brainstem, published um, back 2016. Uh, here showing uh, their uh, proposal of safe entry zone to the midbrain here. <clears throat> Uh, from lateral, lateral mesencephalic sulcus and intercurricular region, midline from midline, and anteriorly, anterior mesencephalic zone. These are the entries, safe entry zone of the medulla. How about pons? Uh, from behind, supracurricular zone, infracurricular zone, and median sulcus. Our Professor Spetzler's group, uh, they proposed the midline. Uh, uh, here is the, they said, uh, safe entry zone. <clears throat> but uh, there is a little bit controversial thing uh, going direct to the, from the midline. But uh, uh, Professor Spetzler proposed this as one of the safe entry zone. And from lateral, Spla, Tragiminal zone, peritragiminal zone, lateral tragiminal zone. Here, these are the safety zone, safe entry zone to the pons. And how about medulla oblongata? <coughs> uh, anterolateral sulcus, lateral medullary zone, orivary zone, and posterior median sulcus. These are the safe entry zone of the medulla oblongata. Well, <clears throat> there are uh, several uh, safe entry zone entering to the brainstem, but uh, to approach that portion, uh, we need to go to that point. So uh, approach it to the brainstem. There are various uh, surgical approaches. Here is just the <clears throat> uh, various approaches to the brainstem such as interhemispheric approach, transcerebrian, subtemporal, anterior petrosal, lateral suboxital, and supracerebellar infratentorial approach and midline suboxital, <clears throat> or occipital transtentorial approach, supracerebellar infratentorial approach. <clears throat> so we can uh, choose any surgical approach to go to the surface of the suitable uh, brainstem uh, lesion, <clears throat> you, including uh, various scalp based approaches. <clears throat> so we need to uh, master these uh, surgical approaches to go to the surface of the uh, brainstem, uh, depending on the location of the lesion and the extension of the lesion. <clears throat> Well, uh, from now, I'd like to show a couple of cases, um, midbrain and pons. <clears throat> Here is the pontine uh, midbrain lesion, 42-year-old woman, came to us with left hand paralysis and facial paralysis, and she showed repeated hemorrhage three months before coming to us, one month, and on admission <clears throat> with this, uh, the patient agreed to be operated on, and we did to resection surgery. And what is the, uh, what is the suitable approach? Well, we selected, we go in from the lateral with uh, <clears throat> subtemporal approach, right side. Here, just uh, the <clears throat> photo, uh, retracting the posterior cerebral artery here is just like a uh, lateral <clears throat> on this side. Uh, from the uh, MRI scan, uh, we thought this uh, is uh, not 
just above the cortical spinal tract, just uh, behind. So we, I enter this and remove the whole lesion. Uh, this showing the post-operative uh, CT and MRI. And <clears throat> well, uh, I know that uh, this uh, presentation is recorded um, uh, up to the YouTube. So I erase the patient uh, uh, vi uh, video and photo. Uh, one week post-operative, she had the lift hemiparesis, but uh, it is improved and uh, unrent <clears throat> and uh, back to uh, the work, previous work. <clears throat> And here is another case of uh, mid, uh, midbrain, centrally located midbrain lesion. 55 year old man came to us with ptosis and diprophia. Uh, he had bilateral local motor palsy with repeated hemorrhage. Here is the lesion. So uh, there's no question about uh, surgical indication <clears throat> and what is the suitable or surgical approach. Well, uh, we selected occipital transtentorial approach. Uh, yeah, entering from the rest superior curriculum. <coughs> uh, with the patient in concordal position. Concordal position is uh, uh, right now very famous, uh, really. Uh, Professor Kobayashi uh, published many years ago, back 1983, the patient prone and surgeon is sitting and doing surgery uh, behind the patient shoulder. It's a good, uh, we can get a good orientation. No need to be a uh, sitting the position. Uh, with this uh, approach here showing the post-operative uh, scan, the lesion is nicely resected, removed, almost totally. And the patient post-op condition uh, he showed bilateral locomotor palsy before surgery and light side that did improve not completely, but no hemiparesis occurred. A week later, uh, he was discharged with sunburn. Well, <clears throat> here is the case 14 year old boy uh, with right hemiparesis. Uh, the region is getting uh, bigger and bigger with repeated hemorrhage and referred to us. And uh, uh, we think we need to be, uh, we need to do surgery. Uh, resection is needed. But uh, here's another uh, lesion. So uh, the patient had multiple lesion, <clears throat> right hemiparesis and uh, the homonymous anopia, anopia he, he had. And I selected the approach, paramedian plus elevella transdental approach, uh, not to damage, not to try to damage the normal structure. So I selected the approach from here, spla cerebella, and cutting the tentorium and reaching the lesion here. And I like to show the video. Uh, here is the skin incision with the patient in the prone position. Uh, this we call waved skin incision. Uh, long incision, but uh, with uh, waved shape incision in the midline. Uh, it's uh, invisible after surgery when the hair uh, wet. So uh, this is uh, a little bit the tiny uh, tips. <clears throat> now at surgery here, uh, retracting the tentorium, here is the left side, and retract the cerebellum a little bit downward, and now <clears throat> going deep inside to, uh, here it's tentorium free edge. <clears throat> the tentorium is cut, transtentorial approach here, cut to the free edge. Then uh, we can see the deep basal uh, vein retracting a little bit lateral. Uh, this vein is retracted a little bit laterally. Now here, 
the uh, major temple rope is also retracted laterally. Then here is the uh, so it's clo very close to the vision, uh, the lateral geniculate body, uh, and here a small incision was uh, placed and vision is entered. And now we can see the lesion very soon, a couple milli millimeters from the surface. And then evacuation gently uh, done under high magnification. Once the lesion is reached, micro uh, surgical approach, microscopic and mic uh, high magnification gently uh, evacuation, resection proceeded not try to uh, make any residue seeing the cleavage of the lesion. Yeah, now uh, entry is uh, seven, eight millimeters. Now here showing post-operative MRI, the lesion is, lesion is nicely uh, resected. <coughs> and the patient, uh, the, he can walk and discharged uh, with uh, right hand paralysis improved, not completely yet, but uh, he can walk. And apparently hand paralysis improved after surgery. <clears throat> now, how about this uh, Pontang uh, 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 big lesion, 21 year old man uh, referred to as Swiss dysarthria and left hand paralysis. With repeated hemorrhage, lesion is uh, almost centrally located, uh, protruding to the post ventricle floor. So, what is the? Yeah, uh, there is no uh, no problem for doing surgery. Uh, indication, I think we have. And <clears throat> what is the best approach? Well, seeing the serial CT scan. Uh, here is the CT scan after the mission, but the initi initially the vision bled and ventrally, and then repeated hemorrhage. The lesion is uh, getting larger and larger. So <clears throat> I think some uh, structures compressed, but there is some uh, neural structures present to uh, between the surface of the false ventricle floor and vision. So I decided to go from anteriorly with anterior tetrosal approach from the right side. Here showing the video uh, from right uh, anterior tetrosal approach with extra draw approach first and drilling the so-called calcis uh, <coughs> triangle. Now uh, cutting the dura, and here we can see the uh, right trigeminal root of the trigeminal nerve. And here I put the <coughs> mark after uh, doing a cortical mapping, and here is no response. And then make a small incision, and then couple wing couple of millimeters. The lesion was reached here. And then vision is uh, gently resected with uh, micro forceps and di micro dissector and suction. Piecemeal, no need to do unblock fashion, remove unblock removal, uh, piecemeal here. Yeah. Here is the after total resection. I like this small uh, cotonite, soft cot cotonite. Here is the entry about four, around four millimeters. And here showing uh, the MRI scan after surgery. And before surgery, the patient had a severely disabled uh, extraocular motion, but after surgery, the movement uh, getting better. And also before surgery, he 
cannot walk, bedridden, and after surgery, he moved. He was transferred to the rehabilitation hospital for some time, but the uh, apparently hemiparesis is getting better after surgery. So how about this case? Another mountain region, 23-year-old woman came to us with a dipropia and repeated hemorrhage. The region is here. <coughs> From anterior or posterior, uh, there are various uh, approaches is uh, considerable, but uh, for this patient, <coughs> I uh, did surgery with anterior petrosal approach like uh, the previous case. I'd like to show from the left, left anterior petrosal approach, the same, uh, almost same approach. Uh, with uh, ICG with angiography was done to see in this patient the venous structure will develop. So I first going inside subdurally and back to epidurally and then and do the causes approach, causes triangle. <clears throat> yeah. A bone curate is uh, another tool to uh, remove the bone very safely. And now here we can see the pontine surface uh, monopora electro to do mapping. And here is the trigeminal nerve and peri or lateral trigeminal area is the entry zone for this patient. Here we can see already the lesion was entered about seven to eight millimeters from the surface to the uh, nearest point of the lesion. So uh, the lesion is uh, deeply located uh, but once the lesion is reached, the evacuation was gently proceeded. Yeah, uh, this post-operative MRI <clears throat> nicely evacuated. And the, after, uh, a week later, the patient uh, can walk. <clears throat> but how about uh, this case? 19 year old woman came to us with uh, dizziness, repeated hemorrhage. It's on terapeutic. Well, uh, this is the case I operated, uh, well, eight, nine years ago. At that time, uh, seeing the MRI sagittal view as the region is uh, <clears throat> uh, protruding to the uh, fourth ventricle. So I went from the posterior, uh, from the fourth uh, <clears throat> ventricle floor. And now, uh, where to inside the fourth ventricular floor? I think it's uh, very important. <clears throat> now, uh, here is the paper. It's cover uh, page of the new Journal of New Surgery. My senior colleague, Dr. Kyoshima, uh, presented, published a very famous uh, paper regarding the safe entry zone from the uh, fourth, from the fourth ventricular floor. Uh, named suprafacial triangle and infrafacial triangle. <clears throat> the concept is uh, to preserve the facial function afterwards post-operatively uh, for uh, considering the patient to uh, ideal activity of daily life and quality. So <clears throat> facial nerve, at least facial nerve should be preserved. <clears throat> so infrafacial tri uh, suprafacial triangle, but uh, I think uh, this is very uh, important and famous paper from Professor Betranfi. Uh, the there are much variation of the facial colliculus. <clears throat> so the important thing is uh, brainstem mapping and monitoring. So to identify the nerve uh, facial colliculus and to monitor the nerve function during the section, and other uh, nerves need to be 
mapped and monitored. This is my colleague, uh, Dr. Koto. <clears throat> well, uh, to here, force ventricle for mapping was done before removing uh, the lesion to identify the entry point. Here's a schema of, uh, from Fosse uh, Kyoshima's. Uh, here is the electrode. Now we can <clears throat> see, show uh, at the video uh, soon. Then transcranial MAP for cranial nerve during the section of the <clears throat> lesion. Transcranial MAP is done for facial nerve. Uh, stimulated at the primary motor cortex. <clears throat> this is the collaboration with a neuroanesthologist. Here, yeah, uh, many, many cause. <clears throat> and electrodes uh, placed here, here, and here. Then, uh, depending on the location, position of the electrode, we can have uh, this kind of uh, activities. Now, then we can know uh, which is uh, hand, which is uh, tying activities and so forth. <clears throat> so back to the case then with those uh, mapping and monitoring, we decided to, we did surgery from uh, post ventricle four. <clears throat> Now, before surgery, the patient had a various neurological deficit, like uh, sixth palsy, light hemiparesis, uh, uh, right uh, facial paresis and light hemiparesis, and so forth. <clears throat> and lesion is uh, here. And as for the intraoperative monitoring mapping, uh, was done for confirm the facial collectors and AVL, transcranial MEP and SCP, all the, uh, these are monitored during surgery. And this uh, helped uh, quite a lot. Now at surgery with a patient in prone position and at first, uh, <clears throat> here uh, we can see the floor of the post ventricle. Here is the median, midline, median sulcus, stream is here. But uh, we cannot see uh, the waste, the facial colliculus. So mapping is needed to locate the facial colliculus with monopolar electrolyte stimulation. And uh, once we have uh, activity of facial colliculus, then put mark here to preserve uh, this area here. Uh, there is a facial colliculus of the left side. Then uh, cover here with uh, cotonoid. And then uh, we enter here the spular facial triangle. Uh, this is the first step with uh, <coughs> mapping. And now, then uh, removal procedures done under a facial transcranial uh, facial MVP multiple potential. Uh, here uh, is the facial colliculus. So taken care not to press the facial colliculus. But uh, when I retract, I press the this portion when facial MEP attenuated, then uh, soon the procedure stopped until it uh, regained the amplitude. Then during that time, I removed the other place. So repeated, uh, we can go uh, here uh, once we know we want uh, too much uh, maneuver causes the uh, MEP attenuation, then the intermittent procedure can be done. It's quite safe. Total resection is, but intermittent uh, resection of this area uh, we can do here. 
and taking time uh, step step by step be uh, the vision was resected removal. Yeah, here is the uh, view after resection removal. Yeah. <clears throat> Then uh, here is the MRI after surgery, the vision almost removed. And here showing the neurological uh, findings before surgery and after surgery about a week later, a six month palsy improved and facial palsy disappeared back to normal and hemiparesis re uh, returned to normal. And six months after surgery, the patient uh, sent me a DVD. She is the medical uh, student of the music school. And here, uh, <clears throat> so with monitoring at uh, the total resection, I was done uh, with preservation of the uh, function, especially in facial function. And how about this case, 54-year-old woman is referred to us with the propia repeated hemorrhage. Not big, uh, but the uh, located dorsally. <clears throat> so from the anterior approach, uh, too much uh, distant. When the lesion is uh, deep, there is a space between here surface of the fourth ventricle four and lesion. If there is some space, then uh, approach from the fourth ventricle four is not recommended, but here is almost <clears throat> uh, protruded to the fourth ventricle. So uh, I decided to go uh, with uh, fourth ventricle four approach and the monitoring like I presented just the, the previous case. Almost same approach with a patient uh, placed in front position here. <clears throat> and the surgeon is, uh, I'm sitting here, light uh, left behind. So uh, this is anatomical orientation we can get quite easily. <clears throat> Now uh, here is the fourth ventricle four. Is <clears throat> the median sulcus. Again, same procedure. Brain stem mapping to identify the facial colliculus. And the superficial triangle was uh, opened. <clears throat> And for doing spra-facial triangle approach, uh, the removal of craniectomy, craniotomy is done uh, close, uh, very close to the uh, transfer sinus to approach to enter from the, not uh, from behind, from here. Uh, with that, the uh, facial curriculum uh, to, pre to, pre uh, to preserve the uh, facial curriculum. <clears throat> now, uh, the lesion was entered and the lesion is uh, carefully resected gently, not to push the facial curriculum. So approach need to be from more lossal, like this. <clears throat> Now, uh, almost total resection was achieved. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and now four to five millimeters. Uh, this is the entry after surgery. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> now uh, here is the post-operative CT scan here. <clears throat> and the patient I think they will, after surgery, a week later. And after this, uh, uh, 
the patient face is shown, but uh, I deleted this. The patient didn't show any facial paralysis. <clears throat> and uh, this, uh, uh, discharged. Well, uh, this is a case I'd like to show when lesion is residue, uh, when uh, we have residue, how do we have uh, approached? A 13 year old girl left uh, came to us who is left to this stage with repeat hemorrhage. Yeah. And for this uh, lesion, uh, we approached from the light subtemporal approach. Yeah, here showing the immediate post operative CT scan. And this might be uh, oozing blood uh, during surgery, but Comparing to the previous uh, bef uh, the scan before surgery, I think uh, this is not the oozing. This must be the residue. So uh, a week later, we decided to do uh, additional surgery with the same subtemporal approach. Yeah, and here is the scan after second surgery. Now during surgery. Uh, I confirmed that uh, this is the lesion, residual lesion, and dissected. <clears throat> so this I just uh, show. Uh, this is uh, one of couple cases uh, uh, which has residue, but uh, in those cases uh, we need to. I think we need to remove doing second surgery, but uh, weak, uh, weak interval. <clears throat> to prevent a uh, post-operative uh, bleeding. <clears throat> yes, uh, well, uh, now brainstem cavernous malformation can be favorably removed with or uh, under knowledge of brainstem anatomy function, appropriate selection of entry point, and precise variation of vision and electrophysiological monitoring and mapping is quite essential. And uh, this is my take home message. I'd like to uh, <clears throat> uh, stress this uh, point uh, for the pontine lesion. Lesions in the ventral or middle side of the pons, anterior or anterior and lateral approach is recommendable. And the lesions, even in the dorsal side of the pons, still anterior and lateral approach is recommendable. <clears throat> but a lesion in the pure dorsal side of the pons, transverse ventricular flow approach can be indicated and is rather safely applied with help of brainstem mapping and monitoring. I think this uh, for doing transverse ventricular approach, I think we need to do a brainstem mapping and monitoring to preserve facial or other granular functions. I think uh, this is my take on message. Yeah, thank you very much for your kind attention. Impressive cases, and you presented the really impressive cases and also the way of reaching them is really, well, very interesting. Um, may I ask you some questions? Sure. <laughs> uh, um, well, I one of the, the the main problem I had is recurrency. Um, of course, when they are the, in my experience, but I, I don't know if it's also in yours, uh, we can have two kind of uh, cavernomas. One with have that have a very uh, capsula uh, around it, and you can grab it and and take it out almost in 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 with a capsula and once you have took out the 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 blood then it, there is nothing around there are some others which are multilobular where you have a lot of different uh, nuclei different uh, uh, part connected like grapes and is in my experience is the, the second kind of, of Cavernomas are very difficult to be to eradicated and to be um, 
very uh, to take out everything because of course on a super sort of super temporal you can stay larger of course in the brainstem you have to spare and pay attention on where you are so uh, in my experience uh, i had um, now uh, some cases of something that left remain after uh, on the mri you see something uh, after so what is your trick to avoid that? And what is your uh, choice once you find some residual in, in the post-operative MRI? Will you go uh, over again? Will you wait? Will you send it to Gamanai for whatever? Well, uh, thank you very much for your time, uh, question, Wes. Uh, well, circumscribed uh, compact type of uh, lesion is uh, not quite difficult, but uh, as you mentioned, uh, the second type, uh, low grade, multi-related. As I show, uh, as I showed, lastly, uh, that that is uh, the kind of uh, multi-orbular. In that case, if we have intraoperative MRI right now in Shinshu University, we have. Uh, but the, it is not the uh, usual institute. So <clears throat> before surgery, I uh, explained the patient, we may have uh, some residue. Uh, so in that case, we may need to do uh, another surgery. So before surgery, we uh, explained that actually in my series uh, about uh, uh, how about that? Uh, well, 10, around 10 percent we have uh, residue. In that case, so after surgery, we took the scan uh, soon. And if we have residue, then we talked to the patient again, uh, not immediately, but a week or two weeks later, not uh, uh, six uh, months and one uh, year, just uh, in short. Uh, recommend to do uh, surgery. And I don't like to send the patient to the gamma knife if uh, we have uh, residue, basically. So uh, repeated surgery with uh, the same approach or uh, is uh, depending on the lesion and with different, but mainly uh, uh, going through the uh, similar, same approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's not always easy to say to the patient, uh, we have to go back for surgery, but uh, I agree with you. I think it's mandatory to go back and take it out because the risk uh, uh, is still there. Yeah. And, and may, may I ask you something else? Um, we observed and uh, we recently published a, a multicenter uh, collection of cases of uh, the so-called OMS tremor. Um, have you ever had a case? Um, we, especially in the mesencephalic region, we we saw two cases of patients that after intraoperative monitor, they went, uh, uh, everything was fine, no problem. The patient went home, uh, but after one month and a half, they come back with a, a really disturbing tremor like this. Uh, they could not use the arm uh, because there was a, um, um, a tremor that was uh, uh, generated uh, by the Oliver and, and the cerebellar circuit uh, with the Sustanza Nigra, uh, and they are late and come after a while. Uh, this is was not described for 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 surgery and and with the so-called safe entry zone they um, but our two cases we went through a safe safe entry zone and there was no way to monitor it but after after one month and a half this was really disturbing um, talking with other with Spencer with Bertalanti with the other. Uh, each one of us has one or, or, or two cases. Have you ever seen it? Well, uh, thank you. Well, uh, I have uh, only 
40 some cases, but among that patient, I never have such a patient having the tremor after some time, but it's quite interesting. It may occur theoretically, but the, yeah, for my small series, the patient that I, I don't have such a case. Mm. Because it's, well, it's something we now scared me because mm. surgery was perfect and afterward there was a big problem. And so are there any other questions around? Yeah, can, can, I a question? a question, can I ask a question? Of course. For yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. See, I have two questions to Professor Hongo and uh, two questions to Professor Sensato. I will start with uh, what a wonderful lecture we had from Professor Hongo. Uh, that was a marvelous uh, exhibition of your surgical skills. My first question is, uh, uh, have, you, have you thought of approaching this lesion endoscopically? through the sphenoid sinus and going to the ventral aspect of pons for a ventral pondine lesion? Well, uh, uh, well uh, yeah. it may be possible, but for me, I, uh, I don't do any endoscopic procedures. So, but uh, I know some doctors are doing endoscopic approach to the brainstem cavernous malformation. I think it's a, uh, uh, it's a great uh, opportunity. Okay, okay. Uh, my, uh, my thing in Japan uh, is gamma knife allowed for uh, cavernous malformations. Yes, uh, yes means that some doctors, uh, specialists uh, doing cavernous malformation, uh, gamma knife are doing uh, gamma knife for cavernous malformation on the brain stem, but uh, very small number of doctors just done and the majority, I don't like uh, send the patient to that the brain okay. scan. Okay. I prefer doing surgery if we, any intervention is needed. Okay, and my next two questions to Professor Sensato, what good discussion he has generated. My first question to Professor Sensato is that tremor probably for one of his patients, you know, the outflow from dendate nucleus is to yeah. support Cerebellar pedangle. Superior yeah. cerebellar pedangle forms the lateral part of the superior roof of the fourth ventricle. So any involvement there could explain some tremor. Of course, if dendrite nucleus is involved, they go for sometimes mutism also. That is probably the explanation. Involvement of superior cerebellar pedangle, which forms lateral roof of the superior roof, superior half of uh, fourth ventricle, lateral part, is found by the uh, superior cerebellar pedangle, probably from involvement of that. My second question is, because, you know, what is your take on cavernous hemangiomas of the cavernous sinus? Are they tumor or pure cavernomas? Because many people have told that these are not cavernous malformations. They are tumors because they are... Uh, uh, MRI picture, behavior, even surgery, everything is different. Such a vascular tumor, it is totally hyper-intense on T2 weighted image. They behave differently. So many people, they think that they are vascular tumors. That is cavernous hemangioma of the cavernous sinus. While vascular cavernomas are actually intra-axial lesions. They occur inside the parenchyma. While cavernous hemangioma of the cavernous sinus, they are extra axial, they occur in the intradural space. What is your take on these uh, comments on this? Of course, the pathology for both the lesions are same. That is very intriguing. Can you tell? Uh, us? Yeah. No, I have no experience about uh, ca ca cavernous uh, in the cavernous sinus. Uh, okay. um, no, I, I, uh, the impression is that as also Dr. Lanzino recently, Professor Lanzino recently published, uh, these cavernomas always have a, a DVA, a, a venous, uh, uh, and the impression is that they grow from the vein. So um, sometimes, and this is another question for Professor Hongo, uh, sometimes the impression is that you, um, 
in um, they grow from the vein and 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 so leaving the vein is a balance that sometimes it is not easy uh, because some of course we all know that dva uh, the, the 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 venous anomaly has to be left there but uh but sometimes uh, they are the cause of, of and the origin of the cavernoma so sometimes you you have to balance and, and what, what do you think about that yeah, uh, thank you very much. Well, actually, honestly, yeah, we'll develop the venous structure. Uh, I can preserve, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, worrying about uh, this must be preserved or uh, this can be resected. Well, uh, in my small cities, uh, we cannot, I cannot be sure to say uh, which is better, but uh, bigger uh, large uh, venous structure uh, are of course preserved but uh, what is the critical uh, border uh, I cannot I, I cannot say uh, it's hard to say yeah hard to say yeah it was a Thank great you. lecture there are many many questions arising but we'll definitely take the questions after the second talk we do not want yeah. a honored guest from China waiting for so long. Professor Senzato, you may please. So now uh, I think it's time to, to switch to the second speaker, Professor Tong. He also is a, um, a very uh, ex expert, a great master in, in vascular surgery. He has a, tons of publication and, and we are really um, curious to listen for his uh, topic on, on the a bypass in posterior fossa for complex uh, aneurysm because posterior fossa, of course, for us is something that we uh, take with uh, some more attention than than for bypasses on the super super temptor, temptorium. Uh, now the many of the uh, subtemporal uh, sub, um, uh, sub uh, and posterior fossa aneurysm are treated by endovascular. So the meaning of uh, a balance between uh, surgery and endovascular treatment uh, is something we, we, uh, which is interesting. So I we, uh, would like to hear your uh, topics and your speech, and then we will discuss about that. Please, Professor Tong. Thank you for joining us and, and for your speech. Thank you all, for all. Uh, I I, uh, maybe my topic a little bit different from the previous one, but uh, this uh, several revascularization on the age, the extreme and the emergent. And uh, I would like to show some cases and uh, because of time, time limit, Maybe I couldn't uh, introduce a lot of uh, 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 statistics. So right now, the bypass technology is also improving uh, in China. And uh, at first, we can see the direct repair for complex MCL neurism. So this is a, a male patient, 46 years old, a complex MCL aneurysm. Previously, maybe we can choose a uh, clipping and a clip shape, uh, a lot of choice for the patient. But right now, we can uh, directly repair and remove the aneurysm. So we can do the operation step by step as scheduled as our previously planned. At first, we do we we put the the inferior branch to the upper branch after uh, ICG and we remove the aneurysm to the second anastomosis. We have two anastomoses and remove the aneurysm. And the post-operative DSA we can see we totally remove the aneurysm. So this the uh, post-operative -oper DSA. So if we compare pre-operative and the post-operative, -oper we can see if we 
precisely, precisely calculated, we can remove the aneurysm in the MC region. So the normal perfusion and uh, very few uh, infection and the patient re become normal. So right now, we think ECA radio artery M2 bypass is a very reliable bypass, just like a kind of flow devoter. We can see this patient is a ICH patient and the M1 dissection aneurysm. It's very difficult to treat this kind of aneurysm because we have a big posterior communicating artery from the dissection. We can put flow diverter, but still have some generals about the PCA, uh, the PCA. How to treat this kind of aneurysm? Right now, we have the hybrid operation room. We can do a very reliable bypass and reverse the flow in the MC. So this is the, uh, the first anastomosis site on the ECA. And uh, we make the second anastomosis. This intraoperative angiography, we can see the flow directly to the posterior cerebral artery. And then we can see the flow is very good and then we occlude the ICA, reverse the blood flow. This one week after operation and one year follow up, we can see the MCA dissection become decreased seems normal and the patient return to normal life. So we can change the flow also for the huge basilar tip aneurysm. This is a, this patient have bilateral common carotid artery occlusion and a very complex basilar tip aneurysm. So how can we treat this kind of aneurysm? The reason for this is the patient no bilateral common carotid artery. The patient's blood flow seems normal. So we didn't, if we directly choose the aneurysm, it's very difficult. So we plan to recontrast the right uh, common carotid artery from the subclavial artery use the saphenous vein. This is the first operation. And the second operation, we, 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 we use the left vertebral artery flow to the left common uh, internal carotid artery, decrease flow to the aneurysm, and let the flow go, in, go to the left internal carotid artery. This is the second operation. So we do this in the hybrid operation room in 2019, and then we use the saphenous vein from the subaccurate artery directly to the uh, common carotid artery. We reconstruct the right common carotid artery, and we can see the post-operative CT uh, CTN. We can see the right common carotid artery and we change the flow. This is the before and the post artery. After one year, we do the second operation. And uh, this time we can see after one year, the flow is also reliable. We can see the aneurysm still there. So we do the second operation and then we expose the vertebral artery and the internal carotid artery. We use the radio artery, transfer the blood flow from the vertebral artery to the internal carotid artery. This is the intraoperative SCT. And this, we let the flow directly go to the left internal carotid artery. Postoperative DSA, we can see the flow from the vertebral artery directly go to the right internal carotid artery. 
So this is the second bypass, we reconstruct the left flow. So we spent two years reconstruct the enteral flow. And we can see the aneurysm seems uh, just like put a flow diverter. We can see this is the flow. So we didn't directly treat the aneurysm. We reconstruct bilateral common carotid artery. So right now for huge dissecting basilar aneurysm, this is very difficult to treat. So we designed several kind of operation to treat this kind of disease. So this patient, this male patient 13 years before has SAH and the patient didn't do any treatment. After 13 years, it become a huge dissection aneurysm. This kind of aneurysm, very difficult to treat. So we can see this the blood flow. And we do this just like previous case, we reverse the blood flow. So this, we use the lateral pulse. We do the two bypass from the vertebral artery to the P2 and occipital artery to the PECA. So this the bypass from the occipital artery to PECA and the vertebral artery to the P2. And we occlude the proximal segment of vertebral artery. This intraoperative, the patient become uh, severe because of the, uh, the expansion of the aneurysm. This is the postoperative DSA, we can see this is the bypass, we can see the flow to the ICA. And this is the bypass this from the vertebral artery to the B2. And this is the reconstruction, the flow after operation, and the flow is reversed. We can see the aneurysm have the a partial operation, but no infection and no more perfusion and the patient recovered after two weeks. So we do this kind of uh, operation, 14 cases, had 11 cases have a good recovery and three cases have poor recovery. So right now we use the two-stage operation. This is also a very difficult to treat basilar aneurysm. We have several offerings. So right now, because this is an unruptured aneurysm. So, so the first stage, we use the red carotid artery, radial artery to the P2 bypass. After this, after the bypass, we didn't occlude any uh, operation, uh, artery. So to the, uh, the flow uh, have some confliction. So we can see the perfusion improved. After three weeks, we have a very reliable bypass and we do the occlusion, use the internal therapy. So this is the post-operative uh, DSA we can see the basilar tip supplied by the bypass. And uh, after operation one month, we still can see the certain level palsy. And one year, the patient seems normal. And we can see the neurism disappeared and a very good bypass for the basilar tip. So for the basilar tip dissection right now, we use the flow divorce and embolization. So this also, 22 years old uh, basilar uh, artery dissection. So we can see from the MRI, the, uh, the clot. So this kind of aneurysm, if you treat with the endovascular, very easily to recurrent. 
So this patient accept two times interventional therapy, have the stent in the dissection. So this kind of interventional treatment, most of treatment failure. So at the first, we do the bypass. This all complex aneurysm bypass group. And we do a very reliable high flow bypass to the postural circulation. After bypass, we can see the flow from the ECA to the PCAR. So this is the reconstruct. We can see the bypass to the P2. And uh, we can see uh, the new the new dissection still there, but we hope we we didn't occlude the the dissection. We hope the bypass bypass become very reliable. So, the patient, the patient become very good. Two weeks after two weeks, we occlude the the dissection. Personally, uh, occlude. And the patient, uh, three days before um, discharge. After half years, we can see the dissection occlude. And the base rate tip totally supplied by the artery, and this reconstruct, patients very good. So how, how far the, this kind of bypass can reach down? This is another case. Uh, and uh, also patient have the several uh, coiling, and uh, we also use this kind of bypass and uh, this the post-operative bypass angiography, we can see very, very reliable bypass, and we occlude the. So we can see the flow can come very low, nearly entire segment of the basal artery, and the aneurysm uh, and de uh, decreased. So. We also use the skull base, uh, this bypass into skull base tumor. So this uh, uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma patient. So this kind of patient uh, re-bleeding after coverted stent. So we can see this re-bleeding re site after stent placement. So right now we use the, the bypass and we occlude the internal carotid artery just below the ophthalmic artery. We open the coronary sinus and uh, put the clip into the cleverness segment of the artery. So we can see this the ophthalmic artery and we occlude the current sinus segment. So we can see we keep the ophthalmic artery, this the bypass. Mm -hmm. And then we can see the bypass and the ophthalmic artery. So we totally replace the the carnus sinus segment. So right now for scar based tumor, especially for the caudal sarcoma, this kind of we use schema bypass. So this the recurrent caudal sarcoma after the endoscope and the scar base open surgery. And then the, the tumor cannot be removed because it involved the left 
internal carotid artery. So before surgery, we can see no good uh, contralateral circulation. So we should do the bypass. So this um, previous operation site, and we prepare the bypass, and uh, we have the different operative view, and this all complex vascular and scar-based room. And uh, we, at the first, we take the radio artery, and we have two neurosurgeons work together. And this uh, one neurosurgeon used the microscope, another neurosurgeon used the endoscope. And uh, we also can bothly use the endoscope. So this the bypass we, we from the internal carotid artery C3 to the intracranial segment of bypass, just like we all we often call this the Fukushima bypass. After the bypass, we use endoscope, open the uh, open the patient's uh, petrous bone uh, to the tumor. And then after the endoscope and the open surgery, we suture the dura. And this is the previous, uh, this is the previous cut line and the way this is the, the new, new cut. And the post-operative CT, we can see, we use this kind of bypass and for if the patient's tumor recurrent, we can remove the internal carotid artery without worry about the, the internal carotid artery. And then if patient recurrent again, we can use the endoscope. So the neurodom and the resected uh, good result. So bypass, personally, I did more than 800 bypass and uh, our uh, mortality and uh, morbidity rate less than uh, 5%. I had studied the scar base uh, anatomy from Dr. Roten in Florida University. And it is our hospital in north part of China uh, our hospital uh, have right now uh, have the 1,000 uh, bite for new neurosurgery. Uh, the right side uh, 500 for the neurosurgery in the middle neurology and the left is the research institute. And uh, welcome all of you visited and the teaching in our hospital. Thank you. Impressive cases. Uh, really impressive. Uh, uh, those uh, basilar aneurysm are something that is very hard to treat, and uh, sometimes there is no way to treat them. So we, it's, I'm, I'm really impressed. Um, I, I saw you, you combined, uh, you delayed the treatment, you delayed the treatment over time. So you said that you wait. Uh, one year and, and let the bypass work. But did you ever have the case or where the, the two flow conflicting together ruptured the aneurysm in the meanwhile? Because this is our uh, fear. Uh, this is a good question. Uh, because um, we treat most of these cases is the unruptured aneurysm. Yeah. So until now, we didn't uh, find uh, uh, such case, but uh, right now we have one maybe uh, for the rupture. But so we... the two conflicting uh, flows do not increase the risk, in, in your uh, opinion, do not increase the risk of rupture of an ruptured aneurysm. Yes, maybe as the experience increased, maybe, but if we occlude immediately we are worrying about the perforators yeah. this may be yeah. dangerous yeah 
this is the balance between waiting and, and yes. Uh, but and do you prefer to use the radial artery rather than the vein? Vein, I've seen. Yes, because the way we use the saphenous vein, we have the failure cases because the the blood flow have some conflicting. If we use radial artery, uh, the long time follow up is very good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I too prefer to use the radial artery, but of course I don't have any uh, anything number comparable to yours. <laughs> so it's your casistic is beautiful. Is there anyone who has another question, Professor? Um, yeah, definitely. I would like to congratulate our honored guest from China, Professor Tong, who showed us exceptionally brilliant cases and very challenging cases. Thank you so much, Professor. Yes, I would like to know about your experience in IMAX bypass or the Salim Abdul Rauf bypass. Uh, how often do you use IMAX for your uh, cases? Actually, in our in China, Doctor Xu, uh, Xu Bin Doctor Xu, uh, in the enteral circulation, I'm in the posterior circulation. So for for me. I have maybe more than 100 cases of postural circulation bypass. For me, at first, I use the internal maxilla artery, but gradually I quit this bypass because if we compare the STA, main trunk of the STA, have nearly the, the same flow as the internal maxilla artery. But if you want to have the very good, very uh, big, a pressured bypass, we, we, we should use the external carotid artery. This kind of artery operating easily and very reliable. If you do it uh, very systemly and check every detail, uh, keep the every detail safe, and it's very reliable. But internal maxillary artery sometimes have some difficulty. So for me, right now, I quit this kind of bypass. May I call my co-host, Dr. Liu? I, I wanted to find out from you, uh, brainstem carbonoma. Uh, you never show us uh, uh, any form of 3D images, uh, 3D reconstruction or fiber tracking. Uh, may I ask how essential are those in the pre-op planning, uh, 3D uh, uh, modeling or images? Uh, probably a uh, pre-op uh, simulation and also fiber tracking in uh, treating uh, brainstem carbonoma. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, well, uh, regarding the fiber tracking, if it is applicable, then I think it's uh, good. Uh, it uh, gives us uh, very useful information when applicable, uh, but the, in my institute, it is not. Yeah, uh, some case uh, before surgery uh, we do, but the not many. And three D reconstruction we do. Yeah, I didn't show, but the yeah, I think it's uh, good for uh, uh, deciding the surgical approach. Yes, I would like to ask Professor Hongo one uh, question that uh, when Professor Uyghur today gave this similar talk about uh, approaches to brainstem lesions. He categorically said one important point that there are no safe entry zones in the brainstem. So that was very uh, contrary to what uh, you have mentioned. And we all uh, have uh, known that there are safe entry zones. And Professor Uguture heavily realizes on the DTI image preoperatively to approach the lesions in the brainstem. Even if uh, he showed one of the cases in which the lesion was bang just below the fourth floor of the fourth ventricle. But uh, after seeing the DTI, he decided to approach from the anterior aspect. So that was all very uh, surprising uh, things he said that. And uh, uh, why in spite of Japan being advanced, why don't you use a DTI? In your place? Uh, DTI, preoperative DTI, yes, we do, but not. Well, <clears throat> does it ch change your decision? 
like mentioned by Professor Ugrithuri? It may help. It may help uh, for deciding. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. If fabricable, it's better to do because, yeah. Uh, for example, if the region is uh, very dorsal to the fourth ventricle floor, but still, uh, sometimes we uh, there are some functional or uh, functioning uh, tract. So for that, uh, uh, I think I I can see with uh, DTI okay. on just the MRI uh, seems very close to the floor of the fourth ventricle, but uh, actually sometimes we uh, we see that uh, after surgery very thin before surgery, but uh, it uh, uh, thickened to normal. So uh, yeah, DTI may help us uh, to see that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think also you need to have a, at least a three Tesla MRI to have something reliable in the in the brainstem. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. and not is not always available at three three Tesla MRI. Um, so I, I I agree that that intraoperative neurophysiology, as much as you can, and also uh, facial motor evocative potential are mm -hmm. extremely important. Um, yeah. um, but, and rely uh, on MRI. I'm I'm not sure if I, uh, regarding yeah, the uh, 3D simulation, 3D simulation. Well, uh, Dr. Kim from Tokyo University. He made a very nice multi-directional or uh, multi-model uh, 3D images uh, before surgery, and uh, he made his own uh, 3D uh, images uh, from the patient. So it may uh, help greatly yeah. for yeah, deciding. These are useful. Yeah. With, with the, there are also the, the brain lab uh, elements, uh, which is a very nice instrument to, to pre-reconstruct yeah. uh, what you will expect and, and to, to choose the strategy. Yes. This, I find it very interesting. Thank you. I can, can I? Yes. Can I to sure. To sure. I, it's, yeah, it's very impressed. What I yeah, uh, I understand that you do such a flow diverting uh, procedure with uh, bypass of so very uh, various uh, types of bypass for unruptured anything. But do you have any case of rupture, not rupture after the procedure for unruptured? But for ruptured case, you have any uh, comment on how do you treat ruptured ruptured case, such a very large and complex uh, anism ruptured anism, not unruptured. Do you have any way to treat? Thank you, Professor. Uh, because uh, I also have some experience for the emergency ruptured algorithm. Most of the time. Uh, for us, difficult to, to do very complex, this kind of bypass. So we often use internal carotid artery directly to the P2, just like we gave patient a post-communicating post artery. And sometimes we use the, uh, from the Fukushima bypass and uh, to the P2. This kind of bypass very or can say very quick, and from the one operative point directly to the bypass, and immediately we occlude the uh, the basilar artery or all the vertebral artery, because we do for the unruptured aneurysm. If we do this kind of delayed occlusion, our mortality and morbidity rate less than three and five percent. If we do ruptured aneurysm and uh, we do it 
immediately occlusion, maybe 10% and 8%, uh, maybe. So this increased uh, the, the, the complication. So for ruptured aneurysm, we, we, we maybe we have to occlude the proximal segment immediately. Okay, thank you very much. You're One welcome. more question that we would like to put across to Professor Tong is that, what is your uh, policy in using heparin during the bypass? So we we use antioxidant uh, for the emergency cases for ruptured aneurysm. We use intraoperative internal vein heparin. Maybe yes, and after bypass we use the anti -pipeline. So if we use the, for the how can I say unruptured aneurysm. We always use anti pipelines. Anti Right, thank you. So I can see Professor Mohan Sharma in the crowd. Professor Mohan Sharma. Excellent right. presentation, both presenter professors. My question is to Professor Hongo Do you consider any, which kind of uh, cavernous malformation you consider inoperable in the brain stem? Uh, thank you. Inoperable. Well, uh... I think uh, you attack everything you see, or yes. I think uh, uh, regarding operable or inoperable, I think uh, any uh, operable. Uh, but think we need to think of the postoperative uh, and neurological deficit. So the deep seated, even brainstem, the the deep seated. Uh, from any surface, and still uh, the symptom is quite subtle, uh, operable, but I don't do uh, uh, surgery. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sharma. I think it's time to wind it up. We would uh, go back to our honored chair to give his concluding remarks. I think we we have listened. Uh, excellent talks uh, by both uh, from both the speaker uh, that we they are well known masters. So we expected a, a, a very interesting speech from each other. And but I think they show us something that we didn't know uh, uh, how to reach some of the brainstem cavernova and and how to treat uh, almost untreatable untreatable. Um, basilar artery aneurysm that uh, open up uh, a really interesting uh, way of treating them. So I just want to thank you everybody and I want to thank you the, the uh, ASEAN Congress of Neurological Surgeon for has inviting me and for letting me to assist uh, to these beautiful lectures. So thank you very much and thank you to all the speakers and can I ask you also to say hello to Yoko Kato uh, uh, and, uh, and, and to all the other uh, speakers. Thank, thank you very you. much. I think thank it's you time much. to close. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank I you. close this officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and our President, Professor Yoko Kato. I would like to sincerely thank today's speakers, Professor Kazuhiro Hongo, as well as Professor Xiao Guang Tang and our Honorable Chair, Professor Marco Senseto, for coming here, spending their time and teaching us about their respective specialities. Each talk was indeed a brilliant talk and we had amazing videos from both of the speakers. We are uh, so thankful to our Honorable uh, faculties who joined today, Professor Suresh Nair, Professor Mohan Sharma, and uh, one name I cannot forget is Professor Zubin, whose incredible support has been through with the ACNS ever since we started these webinars. I sincerely thank my co-host for today, Professor Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia. So until next Saturday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you all for watching.